Good afternoon. My name is John Lindahl. I'd like to welcome you to the Nebraska State Historical Society's Brown Bag Lecture Series held here at the Nebraska History Museum the third Thursday of every month. A detailed schedule for this series as well as information about all the Historical Society's programs and services can be found on our website at nebraskahistory.org. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to thank the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for funding the filming of these lectures. Their financial support allows us to tape and broadcast these programs on public access, access television. And also recently we, we put these programs on YouTube if you're interested in that. We have some very interesting speakers today. Our speakers are Tina Kepi and Jessica Waite. Tina is a Nebraska State Historical Society Collections Technician here at the museum. And Jessica has been a conservation technician and is now curator of research at the Stewart Museum in Grand Island. Their topic today is saving Native American artifacts at the Nebraska History Museum. So please welcome Tina Kepi and Jessica Waite. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is Jessica Waite, and this I'm is Tina Kepi. <laughs> yeah, this is Tina, um, and we're going to talk about our grant project that we had been working on for the past two years. Um, it's a conservation project done here at the State Historical Society Museum. This project was a collaboration between the museum and the Gerald Ford Conservation Center in Omaha. Um, both of these divisions are part of the State Historical Society. And in 1999, collection staff at the museum and conservators at the Ford Center completed a conservation assessment uh, that mapped out the steps needed to improve the quality of materials and storage methods and maximize storage space here at the museum. In order to help uphold the goal of safeguarding our history, it became clear to staff and conservators that a long-term plan was needed to save these artifacts. Um, lack of ad adequate storage and previous museum standards has left many of the items in the museum's collections in peril. The long-term preservation plan, written by the Historical Society staff, created a systematic approach for making improvements to parts of the collection. The first project was conducted under this plan was a firearms conservation and rehousing project completed in 2004 through funding from the Institute for Museum and Library Services. The next step of the plan involved the museum's large Native American collection, which is where we came in. Receiving funding for such large projects is always a challenge, and in 2006, the staff of the Museum of Nebraska History and the Ford Conservation Center wrote a proposal to receive federal grant funding from Save America's Treasures. This grant is a partnership with the National Trust for Historic Preservation, the National Park Service, Heritage Preservation, National Endowment for the Arts, National Park Foundation. And we requested funding specifically for the museum's Native American collection. <clears throat> this, this grant project was to address um, major threats to the preservation of this incredible collection. The, three, um, the, the threats were threefold, inadequate storage space, access to the artifacts, and contamination of t by toxic residues. These threats were causing the collection to deteriorate at an incredibly rapid rate. Um, with the funding, it was proposed to remove or reduce all of these threats um, through the addition of high-density compactable storage units, testing for harmful residues, and cleaning and conserving each object and placing them in proper and safe archival housings. As an additional benefit, the grant also proposed that each, that each artifact is going to be cataloged photographed and entered into the museum's new collection management software, PassPerfect. Um, this would greatly improve access to the information of the collection by staff, um, researchers, and ultimately the public. 
The museum has artifacts from 14 different tribes. Some of the tribes include the Pawnee, Omaha, Ponca, Winnebago, Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Yankton Sioux. Some of the famous Native Americans represented in this collection include Red Cloud, Sitting Bull, and Crazy Horse. The collection includes items donated by the family of Susan LaFleche Peacott, the first female Native American physician. Due to the breadth of our Native American collection and the number of items that relate to nationally significant individuals and events, our collection is exceptionally valuable for research and interpretation of Native American culture. The collection includes artifacts such as headdresses, moccasins, weapons, toys, clothing, blankets, and food preparation items. There are rare examples of late 18th century wood carving, um, as well as many examples of heavily beaded clothing and accessories from the reservation era. The diverse nature of this collection and its exceptional quality in illustrating the cultural heritage of Plains tribes helps make it an American treasure. Our grant proposal emphasized the need for improved space and access for this collection. 85% of the Native American collection was stored in the basement of the museum in metal drawers and cabinets that were difficult to access. Many fragile artifacts were piled in drawers and did not have supportive trays or mounts to protect them. Because the drawers were so full, many objects were misshapen, folded, and forced into tight spaces. Other objects stored on open shelves were unprotected from light, dirt, and potential water leaks from overhead pipes. The first picture here on the left is um, a tangled drawer of feather artifacts, um, eagle fans, there's a feather bustle, and every time that drawer was opened, feathers would catch onto the drawer above it and break off pieces of it, and it was just a bad situation. The second drawer, second picture illustrates how difficult it was to access items in the collection for staff members. So not only were we putting the items in the collection in peril, but we were also risking the safety of staff people as they tried to access these. So here's another couple examples of drawers full of artifacts in our old storage. On the left, there's a drawer full of eagle feather headdresses, and they've all been folded, um, bundled up, and piled on top of each other. The other um, picture is of a drawer full of beaded bags, and they've just been piled together. So when a staff person wanted to get something out of storage, it was they would have to move other artifacts to get to it. We didn't know exactly what condition some of these things were in, and they were just deteriorating in their conditions. So not only were the storage conditions less than ideal, but this collection had been improperly displayed in the past and needed some attention to undo the damage. Many of the items in the collection had never been cleaned uh, or conserved. In the past, sometimes artifacts would be nailed or pinned to walls, and number tags would be attached to artifacts with metal staples. Fortunately, the standards for handling and displaying museum artifacts has evolved, and we have a picture here from 1951 of a museum staff person nailing a saddlebag to an exhibit. We don't do that anymore. <laughs> Here's another museum gallery from 1951. Um, many of these artifacts are either nailed or attached to the display wall with adhesives. So here's an example of what happens to a pair of moccasins that is glued to an exhibit wall for years. Um, not only do we have adhesive and uh, pieces of probably plaster or wallboard attached to the soles, but the stress from being exhibited this way has caused a tear along the, the sole of the moccasin, and it's an incredibly unstable condition. As you can tell, we, there, we're in serious trouble. So um, the grant writing efforts did wonderfully pay off. And the museum received $170,000 in cooperative federal funding from Save America's Treasures. The grant did require a one-to-one -one match of funds. And we had wonderful private donors that contributed $70,000 for this project. And the Historical Society contributed other matching funds in the forms of personnel. Key staff working on the grant were Julie Riley, a, uh, Associate Director at the Ford Center, Debbie Long, Objects Conservator at the Ford Center, Deb Arntz, curator here at the Nebraska History Museum, and Laura Mooney, registrar at the Nebraska History Museum. 
the first phase of the project was involved getting new storage facilities. Um, a room in the basement was uh, designated for this project, and it was fitted with new compacting space saver shelving units, as well as powder coated metal shelving along the far wall. Staff purchased acid free boxes and tissue paper, and a small lab space was set up in the basement. Uh, and outfitted with large work tables and supplies needed to complete this project. The bottom picture is the old is the storage space um, before it was new compacted shelving, which is up here on the left. And then the top right picture is the picture of the lab space in the basement. My home away from home. Um, <clears throat> funds allowed um, for the hiring of staff to work on this project. An assistant conservator, Rebecca Cashman, uh, was employed for one year. Rebecca is a professional objects conservator with previous experience working with indigenous collections. And then two, con two technicians were hired. I was hired as the conservation technician and Tina was hired as the collections technician. Um, I performed basic conservation treatments and developed rehousing um, for the collection. I have a master's degree in museum administration from Eastern Illinois University. And it was an amazing and wonderful opportunity for me to work on this collection because my family is of Oglala Lakota heritage. Tina is, um, was hired as the collections technician and she did all of the photographing, research, and cataloging of the artifacts. Tina was born and raised here in Nebraska and has a master's degree in textile history with a special interest in ethnographic costume. So as you can imagine, we were all incredibly thrilled and honored to work on such a wonderful collection. Oh, that's mine. Sorry. <laughs> and before Tina and I began, Rebecca and the registrar here at the museum, Laura Mooney, completed a comprehensive conservation survey. And so what they did is went through every single drawer and looked at every single object to um, take notes and determine the level and the priority of conservation needed. Um, we have level one, which meant that you had to get it done right away. It was in serious need of conservation treatment. Two, not so bad. And three, it was in need, but it could be done at a later date. Um, and then they, it was decided what type of treatment needed to be um, done on each object, who was able to do the treatments, whether I could do it here or if it needed to be sent off to the Ford Center. And then the most fragile items were scheduled to go to the Ford Center for treatment. And we kept all of this information um, available between the Ford Center and here at the museum in a FileMaker database. As discussed earlier, some of the threats to the collection were toxic residues. And as part of our grant request, we uh, did arsenic testing on the artifacts. And uh, from the 18th through the 20th centuries, arsenic compounds were applied as preservatives and to prevent infestations of insects and rodents to ethnographic collections. Um, it was most commonly used on feather and animal skins. Arsenic adheres strongly to hair and feathers and does not lose its toxicity over time. Um, we were n it's able to see through either it's visible as a white powder or small crystals, and we did encounter many of these over our each you know over the past two years. Um, the older the specimen, the more likely it was treated with arsenic. Um, museum staff here did know that there were parts of the collection that had been treated with arsenic, though they didn't know the concentrations, the quantities, or which artifacts were contaminated. And so before the artifacts were processed, Rebecca Cashman and Laura Mooney uh, swabbed m samples of about 10% of the collection, focusing on artifacts specifically made of feathers and animal fur. And because of the way the artifacts were stored, you saw it piled on top of each other, um, arsenic could have contaminated those items that came in contact with others as well in other drawers. So Rebecca took the samples back to the Ford Center and um, tested them in their labs there. A small amount of the test did come back positive and those um, artifacts were processed separately um, and under specific guidelines and they were also um, placed in standardized boxes 
and wrapped in plastic and clearly labeled that they were arsenic positive. And here you see Rebecca vacuuming an eagle head that was tested positive for arsenic. And she wears a lab coat, gloves, and mask to protect herself from arsenic exposure. And the vacuuming does not remove all of the arsenic, but it ha does help to reduce the loose particles. So we're going to start with a typical day. Tina and I started out trying to figure a way of processing these artifacts in, in the small amount of time that we had. So we came up with a system on how we did it. Um, we would choose a type of object. We specifically went for either bags or arrows. And so we both would cover up with our personal protective gear in our gloves and our masks and um, our lovely lab coats. And we'd go into the back old storage and remove the, um, the trays. As you can tell, it, takes, it always took two people because they were f most of the drawers were fully loaded and quite heavy. Um, so then we would move them into the lab space where we would set them up. Each artifact was associated with a processing sheet. Um, that way, the processing sheet allowed us to maintain and um, keep track of what sort of treatment had already been done to it whether or not um, it needed more treatment. Um, so, as you can see, I'm sitting here. I'm also looking at the um, comprehensive survey that Rebecca and Laura had completed for us so that I knew exactly what to do and what needed to be done. Um, that's it. The processing sheets, you'll see here, had a place of when they were removed from storage, um, whether or not they had been vacuumed, if there was a conservation treatment had been done, um, photographed, rehoused, and then put back in storage. This was done so that we could keep track and make sure that we were completing it and who completed it for future generations so they knew um, who had done the treatments for it. And I'm drawing a detailed picture. I'm not a very good artist, so <laughs> I tried. And then we took detailed dimensions as well of each artifact which then was entered into the database. At this stage of the process, we carefully examined each artifact to see what kind of damage it had. We were able to do some minor treatments and uh, removal of nails and staples ourselves. The most fragile items were taken to the Ford Conservation Center for treatment by the conservators there. So here are some examples of um, some common issues that we encountered. Um, the first photo here on the left, that's a, a strip of leather that was attached to a stone club. And at some point in the life of this artifact, a, a tear was made in the leather and it was repaired with metal staples. So that's the, <laughs> the uh, we also encountered adhesive tape used to repair leather and textiles. Um, those are the type of things that a conservator needs to address and so we would leave that uh, to the staff of the Ford Center. Um, the second photo is of a cradleboard cover, that's the hood of the cover, and it had um, metal wire, like really thick um, wire stitched to the, the opening to keep it, probably to keep it open for exhibition, and that was something that we removed because it's not original to the cradleboard cover. And the third picture is, uh, this is a very common issue that we encountered, and that was um, pieces of metal wire that were attached to artifacts, either to use to hang them on a wall or attach them together. And uh, we were able to use a pair of wire cutters and remove that. Um, in addition to this type of damage, we encountered many examples of how historical artifacts deteriorate over time due to environmental conditions. We saw a lot of dry leather that needed to be rehydrated. And um, we saw a lot of evidence of historic insect damage. Um, we pulled a lot of insect casings, a lot of webbing, a lot of um, insect droppings and frass from artifacts. Here's a, a big picture of, of what that looks like exactly. It's very appetizing. <laughs> and uh, so we would use tweezers and vacuum and carefully remove that. And typically, um, this type of insect feeds on wool and leather and feathers, but they also like to hide out in the crevices of leather artifacts. I don't know if you can see it, but frost all right there, there's there, 
and then it's more down here and also attached to the fringe of it. Yeah. So, and so lots of insects. It's, it's, there's some artifacts. We spent a couple hours just removing that kind of debris from. Um, so fortunately, we didn't find any live insects in the collection, which is always a good thing. <laughs> and the, the standards for insect and pest management in museums are much improved than they were um, 50 or more years ago. So after we did the processing and, and taking note of the, the, um, the treatments, uh, I would vacuum the artifacts with a variable speed nail fisk vacuum that had a HEPA filter and handheld attachments, if you can see. It was very time consuming <laughs> and um, you had to be very, very careful. A small screen was attached over the edge, edge of the hose to prevent, um, that would allow me to catch in case I inadvertently vacuumed up um, small textile fragments or loose beads. So it would catch there and I could keep it. Um, light suction and caution was used, obviously. And then we also use varying types of brushes with um, s different types of, uh, whether it was soft or hard bristles, um, depending on the, the type of object I was vacuuming. Um, we gently vacuumed this, only the surface dirt off. We tried not to, and tried very, very hard not to remove any of the historic dirt. <laughs> yeah, historic dirt, I know. Um, but that would maybe also have a ability to be tested for later on for pollen or anything else like that. So we like to remove it. Plus it adds to the significance of the object. It's part of its story. So once the vacuuming was done and I had figured out what um, Rebecca had done for the survey, what sort of treatment needed to be done, I would start doing that. Um, this is an example of an incredible pipe bag. It's beautifully beaded, and you can see the wonderful, elaborate coloring of quill work on the bottom. However, due to environmental conditions, the quills were unraveling, and some of them had broken apart. And so right here, I'm doing what, I what we call a bridge repair with Japanese tissue paper that was toned with a Winston & Newton acrylic paint to match the color of the... Um, of the quill, and it was attached with B72. And um, everything that we did and still do is meant to be reversible because you never know in the future if there's a better way of doing it. Um, also, we did not do anything to restore it to look like it was brand new. Um, we are preserving it as it is for future generations. Other treatments that um, work besides Quill work were bead stabilization with also B72, which is a, um, an adhesive that is uh, soluble in acetone. It can be removed in acetone. Or with cotton thread and needles, sewing, needles, sewing beads back on or replacing um, bead loops and things like that. We also <coughs> removed non-original adhesives and repaired uh, feather fletchings and um, sinew on arrowheads. After each artifact was vacuumed and stabilized, it had its photograph taken. We also took before and after photos of artifacts that had received uh, conservation treatments. And uh, our camera that we used was a Nikon D40 digital camera, and we took multiple detailed photos of each item. We used PATH's perfect cataloging software for this project. Each artifact has a record in this database. Um, you can add a lot of photos to it. You can, um, there's a little, the image management button in the corner. You can click on that and it brings up a large, high quality image that you can, you can really see the details on it. Uh, we, everything we could find out about the artifact, I put into this database. Description, measurement, condition, everything we did to it as part of its treatment. Notes about the donor, notes about who owned this or made this if we knew it. Um, and a lot of the times while I was doing this, I, we would have some mystery items that we didn't know what exactly it was used for, or maybe it was called something different by the donor, and we, we wondered if they had uh, called it the wrong name. So we, would, we had a, a large uh, collection of resource materials that we consulted and um, were able to research and find out more about these artifacts. 
Once everything is photographed, came cataloged, it then got rehoused. One of our main problems that we encountered with this project was the lack of resources and the lack of um, information out there for us to refer to on how to rehouse some of these items. They're, some of these items are very difficult and awkward sized and needed some specialized housings, but there wasn't anything available. So Tina and I would actually have to brainstorm with um, the staff here at the museum as well as at the Ford Center to come up with some new and innovative ideas for storage. Um, after the rehousing, we made sure that our, the rehousing was basically to provide adequate support for the materials so that they didn't continue to warp or tear or um, become misshapen, which had occurred during the previous storage conditions. Um, we were also careful to minimize the handling and not to overstuff boxes. We tried to rehouse the artifacts in the way in which they were intended to be used. So if they were moccasins, they were fitted out as if there was a foot in it. Um, we did encounter some gloves, which were also stuffed to um, make sure that you don't cause flattening or tearing on the stress on the leather. Um, and then if there were leggings, we tried to pad it out and, and do it that way so it made it look like it was real. Um, and then we rehoused artifacts with like items. So clubs were stored with clubs and arrows were stored with arrows. And in order to um, save space, we used standardized standard size boxes and then trade items inside these boxes whenever possible. Um, so this is a picture of Tina. She's cutting some blue board. Um, and I, <laughs> I caution you, if you're going to cut blue board, please do not cut yourself. That was my big story, and don't bleed all over the place. <laughs> um, here's an example of one of the rehousings that we did. These are some pipe bags. And they are on the box to the top is a standard size box that we used. And they are on blue board trays cut to fit um, the box. And then they are covered with Tyvek, which is a soft structure um, material, to help prevent sliding. And then also they're tied down with cotton twill to prevent, also prevent sliding. And then the, the four triangles that you see are um, in order to help with stacking. So we were able to get four to six of these pipe bags in one box. Oh, so many. Okay. The different types of materials that we use. Um, we had a, a lot of Try what we call tri rod left over from a previous grant, so we were able to utilize the tri rod. Um, we used acid free and lignin free papers, boards, and tissue, blue, acid free blue board, which was mainly used for trays and also custom boxes, ethyl foam, which is a plastic um, of varying sizes, um, a, an eighth to a quarter, and then we also used two inch planks of ethyl foam. Tri rod, Valara, which is a, um, a uh, type of um, padded plastic, and then Tyvek, we used a lot of Tyvek, which is now my favorite thing in the world. Um, you can see here down in the right hand corner is uh, the, the new rehousings for the pipes. They had previously just been put into a drawer, and when you moved it, the pipe stems would, would um, roll in the drawer, and then it was also the uh, pipe bowls were stacked right next to each other, so they were causing um, them to shift and move and like clock into each other. So what you see here is that their pipe stems are in the middle stored on notched tri rod and so that they don't move and they um, are lifted up off the bottom of the board. And then the pipe stems are in sink mats of uh, two inch ethophone planking which we had cut out um, with a hot knife and then covered with this, the soft Tyvek, the soft structure Tyvek. And in the bottom, if you can tell, we also would put what's called microchamber board into each of the boxes. And microchamber is a, um, is a special type of board that actually absorbs um, the pollutants from the air and then it also absorbs off gases so that it helps to preserve and keep the artifacts themselves for a little bit longer. Oh, goodness. This is an example of a headdress that we've rehoused. Um, if you can see here, this is a circular uh, 
about this, the hat size of the, of the headdress. It was a circular made of tri rod with an internal support of blotter paper as well as tri rod. The crown was covered with a Tyvek cap to help um, the easy um, removal and putting the headdress back onto the, the su internal support. And um, the, the feathers on the headdress itself, in order to ease stress on those, they were wrapped with um, Tyvek and tied with cotton twill. Okay, <clears throat> so this is an example of the old uh, storage for headdresses and the new storage. These headdresses were quite awkward because they were very long. Most of them were probably around 90 inches, so we had to create custom boxes and um, a new way of storing. I just want to bring your attention to the white square in the corner. That is um, for whatever fragments that we found, if there were feathers, hair, loose beads that we didn't know where they went, um, they would be put into a polyethylene plastic bag labeled with the object number and then stored with the object for um, either further testing or for uh, later conservation treatments. In the old storage, moccasins were packed into uh, those sliding metal drawers. A lot of them didn't have any kind of internal support. Some of them might have had some tissue paper or maybe some 75-year-old newspaper wadded in there, but most of them were, they were squished flat, they were um, piled on top of each other, a lot of the leather was really dried out. So um, what we did, as Jess mentioned earlier, is we created um, internal mounts for these out of cotton stockinette and polyester batting and um, padded those out to fully support the leather and the beadwork. And then we made these um, custom mounts for each, each pair of moccasins got one of these. And we got the idea from the Minnesota Historical Society. They did a, a similar project. And uh, we made it out of board covered with Tyvek. Moccasins are tied onto the board. This is ideal because you can lift the moccasins without actually having to touch them. So it's, it's good for the moccasin. And um, these mul multiple pairs of these and this type of housing would be placed in a box. So here's the moccasins we looked at earlier that had been glued to a wall. And uh, there's the before and after picture of, of how they were treated at the, the Ford Conservation Center. You can see the adhesive is gone, and uh, the side of the moccasin has been repaired. It's a big improvement. In the old storage, uh, arrows, wooden arrows with metal <coughs> tips and feather fletchings were um, bundled together in boxes where the feathers were damaged as they were touching each other. Um, we put these in new boxes on trays and they have little um, tri rod supports under each one of them. So none of the arrows are touching the board or touching each other. We had a, a small collection of handmade ropes and lariats and some of these were very dry and not flexible. So we weren't able to do too much with those as far as, as rehousing them, just we tied them to a board. But um, the ones that were still flexible were gently wrapped around um, columns made out of board to preserve the shape. And this is nice because you can then you can lift the tube out of the box and you're not disturbing the other artifacts. Um, the museum has a nice collection of um, of Native American dress, and a lot of the dresses in our collection are heavily decorated with um, elk teeth, cowrie shells, a lot of tin cone jingles and coins, things that are, are heavy and can damage fabric. So the top picture is a, is a wool dress decorated with cowrie shells and tin cone jingles. There are also strips of very fragile silk ribbon stitched to the dress. and. Um, some of these dresses were folded up in metal drawers and then piled on top of each other, which is not good for, for the materials. Um, so for each dress, we each garment like this, we got it out of storage. And in the lower picture, Jessica is, is using a pair of tweezers to painstakingly remove every piece of debris and lint and fuzz from that. And when she's done with that, she uh, would vacuum it with a screen. And then we would rehouse it. and. 
Um, a lot of museums use acid-free tissue paper for stuff like this, but we didn't feel that provided enough support. Also, acid-free tissue loses its um, acid-free qualities over time. So we made Tyvek pillows to support this dress. We were able to get it in a box without putting any serious folds in it. It's kind of curved into the box in an S shape. And then we have made pillows that go into each curve. So it's gently laying in there and it's not causing friction on itself. So here I am putting a box away into our new storage. All of the boxes are clearly labeled about what they contain and it's easy to find things. This new storage is um, safer to access. You can get a, a, a ladder back here, a step stool very easily. And the difference between the old storage and new storage is very dramatic. And here's a, a picture of uh, Deb and Laura removing an item from our old storage and you can see that it's it's just precarious and so on the other side is our our new storage filled up with boxes of of artifacts that have been properly conserved and rehoused well we achieved the goals of this project our funding runs out at the end of december and uh, jess is now working at the stir and i'm i'm still here working on paperwork and updating the database and taking care of some end of the project details. Um, the collection of our Native American artifacts is clean, safe, organized, and cataloged and photographed. Um, museum staff can consult the database and see multiple photos of artifacts and read a detailed description. And uh, although this, although we're done with this project, there's still a lot to do. This, this collection is going to need continued conservation and maintenance in order to, to make it last for future generations. We know which artifacts in this collection are gonna need more work. Um, our conservator was only funded for one year, so we weren't able to have every single item that needed conservation treated. So in the future, we'd like to, to hire a conservator to come back and, and work on this collection some more. And we're in the process of putting a lot of our database information from the museum on the website so that it could be accessible to the rest of the world. Um, and we also have plans to put information about how we did some of this stuff on our website so that other museum professionals, collectors, um, families with Native American collections can, uh, can learn how to properly store them. So now that this collection is, um, is in better condition, we can use it more for research. We can, um, it's more likely to be put on exhibit or to be used for loans. And uh, we also have new information available to tribal groups um, that are interested in, in learning about these items. So we'll, we'll continue to need, um, and this is only part of the conservation project at the museum, and there, we're going to be working on other collections um, and looking for continued funding for that. Um, by continuing this work and preserving museum collections, we help create a link to the past and provide valuable opportunities for learning and understanding the legacies of history. Thank you for coming to our presentation. This project would not have been possible without the generous support of um, several very generous private donors, the Nebraska State Historical Society, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, National Park Service, National Endowment for the Arts, Heritage Preservation, and the National Park Foundation. And if you have any questions, we would be happy to Please take them ask. Now. Yeah, somebody. Uh, Bear Claw necklaces. Yes. Mm -hmm. And what tribe were they from? Oh my gosh. I believe they're a Sioux. Sioux maybe? Yeah, either a Lakota or, or one of those. What about artifacts from the <coughs> We have some, yes. It, in the in the near future, um, we've just gotten the software to convert um, our past perfect database to use on the internet. So, so I I would say within the next year yeah. that 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 will be possible, which will be really nice. Can you put a number to the amount of items that you have on? I mean, is it like two thousand, twenty thousand? Um, um, we worked on 
over 3,000 artifacts during this project. And every single artifact was uh, viewed and had some sort of treatment done to it. And then when you talked about prioritizing one, two, and three, mm -hmm. um, like what would have happened if everything was a one? <laughs> <laughs> That's that's one of our big you know our big problems is why why there we need continued funding for more conservation because not everything was <coughs> able to be treated we we were limited on time and on funding so um, the best we could do is is number one is to get it out of its previous conditions and rehoused and supported and and noted and so we'll be keeping an eye on that and making sure in the future that those number one priorities will get done. Oh, go ahead. The Ford Conservation Center is a division of the State Historical Society and it's centered in Omaha. Um, they have a wonderful new, the staff is actually sitting back there. Um, they have a wonderful new uh, paintings conservator, Kenneth Bay. And then uh, Debbie Long, who is the objects conservator at the Ford Center. Um, and so they do uh, a lot of conservation work for the area. And it's also, um, I guess, Fonda, if you want to say a little bit about it. <laughs> we, we feature it as primarily as all of the collections of state of Nebraska, but then we do work with private individuals and the museums of the skin area. And pretty much anyone that can contact us can have conservation work done on quite a variety of things. We're just the, pretty much um, three-dimensional object um, working. Yeah. Is it open to the public? It is um, by appointment only, but you're welcome to call and come either your students or you know, schedule an appointment with a contributor if you'd like to bring something in. <laughs> yeah. Were there any objects that you, in particular, were really excited about working on or that were real challenges? Can you tell us about? Uh... Um, <laughs> one of, the, my job was, was quite monotonous at times. Um, I distinctly remember working on quilled picture frames where about 75 to 80 percent of the quills were broken or needed some sort of treatment. So I, on average, probably each picture frame took anywhere from 8 to 14 hours of, of work to do. And so I would have to cut the Japanese tissue and tone it to the correct time and, and wait until the glue dried and then, yeah, so it was, and I had to have like four hands, so Tina would have to come, I'd say, you know, help me, I need you to put this there. Um, but those were fun. My favorite thing was that, that beaded um, pipe bag that you saw, um, that picture, it was absolutely gorgeous beadwork and coloring. So that was my favorite. For my favorite, it was working with the artifacts that had uh, textiles on them. We had some silk applique blankets, and then um, they're fascinating and complex, and, um, but the silk is very fragile and brittle, so it was lovely, but also just sort of bittersweet seeing that kind of damage on something. And it was also quite interesting to see um, what types of materials they used. Uh, leggings would the uh, um, they would be lined with uh, flour sacks, or um, we came across this a lot uh, reusing um, materials. So most of the rawhide um, bases of the soles of the moccasins were actually had previously been par flesh. So it was elaborately painted, but yet still, you know, yeah. being used as the sole of a shoe. Yeah, during the reservation era, people were not able to get out and, uh, and get new materials um, that they would um, have previously. And so they recycled a lot of their old regalia in order to make new, new moccasins or new clothing. Another thing was <laughs> the moccasins, some of those that we could find that had been stuffed with um, just loose polyester batting or whenever we pulled it out you could actually sort of still smell the smell of feet. So <laughs> <laughs> it was still there. <laughs> That's history. It made us feel very connected to the people who wore them. <laughs> Are 
there any other collections in the museum that are in such appalling condition as these things were? Uh, yes, but in, oh, in different ways, um, and we, we hope to eventually, you know, our long-term plan is to get to all of those artifacts. Um, the museum has a large collection of quilts. A lot of those are in, are in need of acid-free boxes and, uh, and acid-free tissue to properly store those. Um, we have a lot of examples of historic costume and military uniforms, too, that, that hopefully they're in the future will be funding to give those the attention that they deserve. I have another question mm -hmm. about acid-free materials. You yes. said earlier that acid-free tissue paper loses its uh, anti-acid mm -hmm. properties. How long does that take? Um, usually about, uh, I believe, every 10 years you need to redo it, <laughs> right? And, and you ask on your Object. Yeah, it, de it, dep it depends on what type of objects that you have, and the, can, the ladies at the Ford Center will be able to help you out with that, <laughs> if you have any questions. <laughs> That's why we liked using Tyvek um, that we got from our conservation supplier, because it does not break down over time. The, the Tyvek that we used was a soft structure, and so it was, very, it was easily sewn, so we could, we could sew pillows, we could sew caps, we could, you know, create, I even sewed a pair of like legs, pants for <laughs> um, uh, some artifacts. So we really, in, really, really enjoyed it, and it was it was flexible, and it was you were easily allowed to wrap things in it, and it wouldn't cause any sort of abrasion. So that was one of the wonderful materials that we had. My mother-in-law recently died, and I was going through her stuff, and I had some, found some pictures that were back from 1810. And um, is there more information to help? I mean, these things were just like, they were in really good shape. She had mm -hmm. just kept them in a dry drawer. But is there something that you can find a book or something to help a person who has this kind of stuff? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, there is There is a website. Um, actually, the Ford Center had done a project uh, where there is a website with NTV, NET. Um, and the ladies at the Ford Center will be able to help you out with that. Well, I just wanted to say thank you guys for thank you. showing up and asking wonderful questions. Thank you very much.